Hello, welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Guest today is Kevin Dominic Carter. Kevin, you ready to be great today? I'm happy to be here. Kevin is a technology executive, board member, and IT innovation and growth strategies. Kevin dedicates himself to inspiring people to take control of their time, data, and dreams in IT business and life. A German native, Kevin moved to Seattle in 2013 to take over the role of president of, is it Uninvention North America? Univention. Univention North America. As a startup investor, Kevin focused on tech and fintech. Kevin, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Kevin, um, first, you know, you moved from Germany in 2013. I was actually in the Germany twice, you know, when I was in the Army. First time was the town called Gibble, stopped by Würzburg. I was, I was, that was when I was single. Then I came back again when I was married to my wife. We lived in busy Wiesbaden for two and a half years. And just a great time. Like, I mean, of course, you, you know, the beer is like top notch, right? You know, like you can't beat the beer over there. And the, and the wine is pretty good too. And just the food. Um, so what part of Germany are you from? I'm from the very north. So closest biggest city is either Bremen, if you're on the German side, yes. or then anything Groningen, Amsterdam is nearly as close to it. So you're really close to Amsterdam? Yep. How many, how many trips do you go to Amsterdam? To go to go to go to the brownie store. <laughs> um, not so much in the brownie stuff, but it's a beautiful city to visit, anyways. Yeah, it's a nice place. Um, and so you came in 2013 for your business. Was that voluntary, or did the company say you move into Seattle? No, uh, my wife got a little job offer here, and then I said, "Okay, here's my business plan. Please take me over." And with what? How many did we have then? 25 people. You still could just approach the CEO with ideas. And it wasn't as formalized as now with what 150 people. Nice. So what was some of the culture shock for you coming to America coming to America? I think the big shocker was how close it is and how different it is at the same time. My favorite story is uh, yeah, everything's fine. Which in Germany means everything's great, and which here means please leave me alone. <laughs> I know, right, right. Um so Moving to the moving to the states, um, do you, do you have do you and your wife have any kids? We got kids here. Okay, so. okay. So they're like they're like Americanized German, so to speak. They speak both languages, but I think they feel more culturally at home here. Have you been to that town called Leavenworth, Washington? <laughs> I think everyone here has been there. Yeah. That's, uh... I, I mean, I won't get your opinion on that. Like we were in Germany all those years, right? We did all the German stuff. You know, really liked it. My family really liked it. And we're like, this is Eleven Worth. We're in Eleven like, man, this is some crap, right? It's like, this is a poor imitation of best, right? The beer doesn't taste the same. Food doesn't taste the same. It's like, it's pretty and all, but like, so I want to get your opinion as an actual German citizen, what you thought about that. It's kind of like Disneyland, really. Yeah, you're you, right. you go there to, to see the architecture, to see them play the very stereotypical songs, and you don't go there to have the authentic experience. Yeah, you're very right. It is the stereotypical songs, yeah, and nothing is authentic, yeah. That's a good tourist place, you know. It's at least to see it once is fun. Mm -hmm. And I mean, but, if you can't get to Germany, it's it's a not a bad, you know, knockoff. You can't make it to Germany. If if you can do it for just one day or two, yes, then it's definitely a good idea. Uh if you do it longer at some point, at least for me, the it gets to me at some point. Yeah. Have you your family been able to find like any actual authentic German restaurants or German beer here in Syria? A beer you get nicely, um, especially craft beers by immigrants and uh, they are yeah reinheitsgebot and they, they write that then on there yeah no high fructose corn syrup and like yeah that should be in beer anyways yeah i remember i, I try to tell people like like um what's it called man um october fresh right and like there's no way it's like that like dude you have no idea how great october fest is right down in munich i try to tell them that you know some sometimes i don't think they believe me right how big it is and how much beer and what a great time you have there the more interesting thing is not so much the Munich one. I think that's very commercialized, very, very much touristy. I think if you go then really anywhere in Germany, you have the what's called Erntedankfest, which is like Oktoberfest and in the small villages, which really celebrates the harvest. Yeah. yeah. And then there, there you have some the local beer and the local food and kind of the, the high school graduate band. <laughs> I remember when I was German the first time I was maybe 19, 20 years old. Still to this day, the best beer I've ever had. We went to like this little, like a, was a, like a field trip, right? We went to visit this, this monastery that made beer. And like, they've been making beer since like 
year 200, something like, like that. All the monks are like, no, stay under McBeer. And the mugs were like this big. And like, man, it was so good. I still to this day, that's the best beer I ever had. Some, some beer made by monks. Yep. That wasn't even close. Plus, you then have, of course, the rivalry. You can't go over there drink their beer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so here's a question for you. So like most people know in Germany, there's pretty much no speed limit, right? I mean, I, I tell people, well, you, you could be on Audubon going 100 miles an hour and three cars will like blink the lights and like you better move your ass over if you can get run over, right? How difficult was you to trench, like, you know, go from like pretty much no speed limit to like all crazy, insane slow speed limits? How hard that it could take for you to get used to? I think the speed limits weren't really the problem. I think the big difference is driving everywhere and that there's no public transit or really a trip from here to Portland or here to Vancouver, BC in Germany would probably take the train and here you either take the car or fly. I think that's a bigger difference than the speed limit because to be honest, you have traffic jams as well. So it's not that much of a difference for the speed limits. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, like Seattle likes to brag that we have this real good public transportation system, but it's like, like nothing compared to Germany. Like Germany is so easy. Yeah, for everywhere in the world, like I was in South Korea, or Germany, you just, you know, even if you can't read the language, you can just, it's pretty easy to figure out how to go from, you know, Wiesbaden to Frankfurt or, you know, Paris or where the case would be, right? Here, not so much. Yeah, plus the number of trips you can do here. I mean, I think every German city in the same size as Seattle, if you look at the transit going between what, 1 a.m. and 4 a.m., you would have more transit than what goes here during rush hour. Yes, yeah. I for, actually, I forgot about that. That's a good point. It is very reliable over there. So next, um, let's talk about gardening. <laughs> what got you interested in gardening? Just more kind of the relaxing thing, and you can get kill something without having to worry about someone complaining about it. Um, and the other thing, of course, doing it with my kids, having like the activity. I think what really got us started was our now seven-year-old kind of the plant home was like, yeah, we have to plant it somewhere. We're like in the townhouse with just a lawn about the size of a, a rock. And <laughs> yeah, let's build a raised bed. And then we moved out to between Redmond and Duval, but like a, just an acre or so of land. And I'm like, yeah. There's dirt there where they just digged out the old septic tank and let's build a garden there. And that kind of gets you falling into it. Is there any certain like vegetables or fruits you grow or just whatever the kids want you to grow with them? Uh, me, I would love to do different things. And, but in the end, it's mostly tomatoes because that's when the kids like, whoop, whoop, whoop. And from the, yeah, from the shrub directly into the mouth. Nice. And how long have you been doing this gardening thing? Is it a brand new thing or? Oh, six years now. Six years. Okay. But it takes time to develop. Yeah, you like any skill. You got to have patience. No doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you did it just so you could have something to do with the kids or? Yeah. The activity okay. with the kids, getting out, making use of the space we have. And from there, it just grew. And kind of the fun thing, you, you harvest something and then you eat it directly. Yeah. Then you get like. And there's any worry about all the pesticides from people putting on it and where it came from and all that kind of mess. You don't have to worry about that. And especially for certain greens, it's a complete different taste. So it's like right, right out of the garden into the, on the plate. Yes, yes. Um, so next, let's go to model trains. So you have you got a lot of very different and, and hobbies, so to speak, which I think is good, right? So model trains, is that something else you started came to the States? That's something you were doing since you were a kid. That's something I've been doing as a kid. I think I got, well, I first started with my dad's train set. And then at, I think nine, I got my own one. And then from there, it's just organically growing. And then you get back into the stereotypes, like the train going around the Christmas tree. And that gets then the kids interested. And suddenly you go like from, okay, that's a very simulated of how German railways work to, okay, there's a dragon on the line. <laughs> And keep on doing these interesting things with it. So does your wife let you have a room in the house? Or is it nothing about your model train set up? You go on the play the trains whenever you want to? Or are your wife like, no, you only do this up during Christmas time? Um, it's like in segments, so we can put it up in the family room and then quickly get it out of the way if we want to do something else. But uh, with two kids around, making a whole room for it is problematic because with a what, four-year-old, there's like, yeah. up, I'm grabbing it and something which is then two inches in size, <laughs> yeah. it's not 
good for unsupervised play yet. Yeah. So how many model trains do you have? I honestly don't know. So that many? That's like, like over 10? Uh, around 25. 25, okay. Something. And like, what's the average size of them? Like, how many cars are each train? I mean, 10 cars, 15 cars? That's uh, best guess. I think my best guess would be like three cars per each. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah, it's just people have some the idea. Okay, we found the engines on the... Uh, on the, in the attic or in the basement, here's yeah. the engine, and then oh, the the cars look so rusty. I threw them away, and I'm like, oh, why do you do that? So, are you selling a train? Like, I know some people on like on trains they have like they have the story for each train, like they have the little conductor, they will have the background story of the conductor, like the conductor came from Dallas, Texas. He came, you know. Are you that detailed? Or are you just like do no. trains? Not that you're not that bad. Okay. No, I, I'm I'm more into getting the landscaping nice and have them drive nicely through the landscaping okay. and any of the Okay, that's the train from Dallas. He needs to bring cattle to Wyoming for slaughtering. And if it's late because there's some other train. Okay. Yeah, so that's not the type of thing. And I guess my kids will also be like, why <laughs> is it so boring? That's a great point. Yeah. Um, and then you also do sailing. Is that like you do competitive sailing, like the America's Cup stuff, that high level, or you just do it for fun? Just for fun. Okay. More like the trip sailing, how others do camping. Okay. This kind of and is it like I know a lot of people do sailing like down like from here down to California or like all these sitting, nice sailing trips. How much do you do that? Do you do? Uh, not so much right now because okay. yeah, kids who can't swim yeah. or not really into yeah. that yet. What was the last time you were able to go sailing? I think the last biggest trip was just before we came here. Okay, so back in Germany. Yeah, back in Germany. Oh, the biggest trip actually was Miami to uh, Italy. So you, so you sail from Miami to Italy? Yeah. Uh, oh, shit. Went on a crew which took that over, took the ship over for, I think, winter or summer. Summer, I think. How many people are on the crew? Uh, we were four people on the crew. Man, like, that's insane. Like, I've heard people, like, doing all around the world, you know? I can imagine, like, of course, if you have, like, all the tech stuff, GPS stuff, I mean, safety stuff, you know. But still, the line of ocean is pretty freaking big. Oh, it's my retirement dream to go sailing around the world once, is it? once the kids are in college. So. Is, is that your wife's retirement dream? <laughs> I told her that that's our retirement dream, so let's see. Man, so what, what are some of the dangers of I mean, you had to sail from Miami to Italy? I'm guessing like you know where the big ships are at. Like, do you know like all, all like the whales and like pods or stuff like that? Or weather. It's weather hasn't, is the biggest thing. Hasn't changed in hundreds of years, weather. Okay. Is, Still the big problem, storms, especially. Okay. And, and like, I'm guessing there's no TV station you dial in the middle of the night ocean to see, hey, where the storm's coming from the next 20 miles, right? Uh, ham radio. Ham radio, okay. I yeah. forgot about ham radio. That's yeah. pretty reliable still, isn't it? It's still reliable. It's still what they use. And, well, now you can get it via satellite as well, but the old school tech yeah. maps, and so it's still on board. So when you were selling from Miami to Italy, like, how many boats did you pass? Like, whether there were big cruise ships or other ships, or what are you mostly by yourself most of the time? Most of the time, there was our ship, and then until we reached like the Strait of Gibraltar, nothing around it. Man, yeah, so how do you? So I'm guessing these three people, so it's four including you, right? Yeah, four including me. So I'm guessing like these are people you knew. I can't imagine doing a thing like that with like completely strangers. No, so I, I hired onto a crew and okay. have not met them before. And oh man, like how did that work? Like, of course, you have no choice to get along, I guess. Uh, it was definitely interesting. Yeah, you, I don't have a choice to get along. And thankfully, they were all more experienced than me. So they kind of hardened up and probably also more in this sense of, yeah. Yeah. So how do you deal with all like the silence and quietness? Like, you know, like just being out there in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. The same way people deal with you know, Arctic expeditions or things like that. Mm -hmm. They just find something to do. Yeah. And on a boat, there's always something you can repair. Or in the worst case, you read the books that are on board. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, before you take a trip, how experienced a sail, sail, sailor person were you? I've done trips with my family on okay. that Okay, so you're pretty so, experienced. You're like, yeah, I, okay. at least uh, knew, knew what the lines do and mm -hmm. how to sail. I think the big issue was learning the language because words are different in yeah. English, which we use to communicate versus uh, German or Dutch boats, which yeah. I've sailed on before. Do, do you have a sailboat now? No. No. <clears throat> I 
I'm not so much for not wanting it, but not so much for wanting to take care of it. So yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and if you have a sailboat, what would you like sail in the Puget Sound or Lake Washington? Like, yep, yeah. I mean, you can rent the small yeah. ones around here nicely to stay on. Yeah, Lake Union or Lake Washington. Yeah. So you have any itch to start sailing anytime soon? Or are you gonna wait for a while? Oh, uh, maybe this year. Yeah, as both the kids can swim now, can take them out on one of the smaller boats here on the lakes and then that's good see how they fare was falling into the water when <laughs> yeah you turn the boat over i know right um that's, that's pretty interesting you, you sail from miami Italy. that's insane and so you just like apply to go on a boat and they took you so yep so you're you're like were you like a what's it called like a deckhand or something or like yeah the rank would have been a deckhand okay so unlicensed okay and we what year did you do this uh 2008 okay so you're like you were like you know college pretty jump. like pretty successful you know like man that's that's yeah i might need to do that add it to my bucket list <laughs> so last question about sailing like did you get did you were, you were you getting seasick a lot i've not been much seasick but it might also be depending on the boat mm -hmm. because generally on catamarans which have like two pieces of in the water you yeah. don't get as seasick yeah so thankfully that went away or past me yeah i used to go deep sea fish out of westport washington like every year i think i've gone seven times maybe maybe six times right i used to go with my son different friends the first three times i went like nothing you know i would drink have a good time no seasick the last three times man i was seasick as a dog every time so it was the last time i said i'm never going again well, it's generally it's coastal or shelf waters, which have like the small waves, which mm -hmm. you don't see mm -hmm. or the really big storms. And thankfully, neither of them are what I've experienced mostly. So I would wager I'm getting seasick in those conditions as well. Yeah, that's true. That's a good, that's a great point. So next, let's talk about you being a dad. That's something you're very proud of and take <laughs> a lot of pride in. Talk about like what it means to be a dad and what kind of role model you want to be for your kid children. That's, first of all, it's a lot of work, I think. It's, uh, the the thing which people like to forget that how much work it is and how much you have to do but for the role model i think the the big thing is to get them to make their own decisions which that's something i'm proud of that i had the option to choose what i want to do where i want to go and had the support on choosing my own way and not be the dad who says okay you have to be the lawyer you have to get into harvard law school but also on the flip side, get someone who's responsible and who actually makes a decision, not says, okay, I'm waiting till my thing falls onto me. Yes. That's mine. Okay, no worries, no worries. Sorry. Sorry, I thought it was No worries. Um, and, and how old are your kids again? Seven and just four. Oh man, I, like from my experience, that's the perfect age for kids, right? Cause like they're kind of independent, they're doing stuff to own. They still kind of look up to you, right? Like no dad's still the superhero, right? So you have the kids a perfect age right now, I think. The, dad is the superhero, dad can solve problems, but also still, okay, I'm better not make him angry. Yeah. Well, enjoy where you can, cause before you know, it's like, dad doesn't know what he's talking about. Like who's this guy? He's so old fashioned. He doesn't know anything about anything. It's a great thing that we have a neighborhood with a pretty mix. So there at, at pickup, you can sometimes see, ah, oh, don't give me a hug. There's my friends <laughs> are there. Exactly, exactly. Uh, here's a question for you. Um, how about this question? So a lot of parents, I think, like you said, they think I'm a successful parent if my kids go to Harvard or my kid's a lawyer or my kid does something else. I mean, for any of you, what would you make, make a successful dad once your kids are growing up? I think, yeah, them making their own decisions, them being successful in the way they define it. And if my kids say, okay, I, I'm successful by being a tree climber and making posters about the environment, then sure. I think, yeah, having them choose what they want to do, having them decide what they want to do and having them make the decisions, that's how I would define success. So much more in they do what they want to do and they have to follow through to actually do it. Yeah, that's one thing I struggle with. Like all my kids, like they're pretty self independent, like their 20s, 1s, and 30s. They don't say, and like sometimes, man, like, do you, need, do you don't even know more, right? 
you know, can you ask them how one set of balloon went right? Uh, you know, like, oh, I got it. I got it right. So that's one thing I do struggle with, right? Like, you know, like, man, I read them too independent. Like, like, man, you don't need me at all. Like, shit. But it is what it is. Uh, I don't know whether that's a bad thing or a good it, thing. It's a good thing. I mean, it's that you know. Yeah, it's. But as a dad, you always want to like want your kids to need you. I think you know, no matter what the age is. You want, yeah, you want them to need you, and but then you again, have to learn to let go. Yeah, but then again, those are asking for your help every single day. Like, damn, you know, like what's going on here, right? Might also be the difference. I don't know whether you have sons or daughters. I have, a, I have a two dollars and one son. Uh, might might be the difference because daughters are still the little princess, no yeah. matter how we get into all, all the questions about equality. That's very true. Um, so next, so talk about what you do as far as um, your, your your startup investments. It's the classical people have great ideas, have the follow through to do it, and just need some money to. Do it and then they come with okay i need twenty thousand thirty thousand dollars to get started and that's normally where i jump in and you are you investing only in the seattle area or are you invest back in germany like where's your general us us so okay seattle is of course a strong point bay area uh funnily enough florida as well yeah yeah miami is like a hopping happening place right now yes uh well, they have all the spaces available after all the crypto bankruptcies. So. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, are you are you like a part of an angel syndicate? You invest in your own? We don't have VC. Like, how do you do your investments? Yes, either via the family office or via angel syndicates. And okay, okay. And do you have like any? So I know you invest mainly in fintech or tech. Is there any specific industry? Like any more details you can give us, or is this based on the idea and the people? It generally, yeah, stuff that I understand, mm -hmm. first of all, but then it's, yes, and it's at early stage. It's very much the people, the founding team, the mm -hmm. three, four executives who are in the team, which makes them the make or break on the startup. So this might be, be requested, but like, what would, so suppose somebody's going to invest with you, once they, they pitch you, whatever, what would that person need to do for you to say, there's no way I'd invest in this team. Like, no, no way you're held out. I give this people money. What are the mistakes you see people do when they pitch you? I think the biggest mistake is okay, we built it and then customers will come. That's one of the big ones. Or we haven't built it. We just have the bright idea. Give us money to build the first prototype. I think that are the two ones where, okay, no. No, no one's going to buy it without marketing and without sales and no without a prototype especially in in the tech industry you're you're not getting any money yeah i think a lot of startup founders are struggle with that like a lot of founders are like they'll build a great product no marketing or the vice versa they have all this great marketing no product right and it's like hard to like, sync together right it's it's very hard yes and it's also one of the reasons if you look at these old established companies who you use as examples, um, whether it's Walt Disney or the Wright brothers, you normally have brothers or people who meet very early in high school who started because on the one hand, they have the trust of knowing each other for a long time, but you also then have one person who does like the vision, the marketing, the sales, and the other one who really builds the company and who doesn't want to be in the spotlight. So that's one of the things which normally if you have two people doing it, it's much easier to do it because there's just so much of a difference between the marketing guy who goes like, yes, everything is great. <laughs> and the more technical, more operations guy who goes, okay, we have to do this, 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 this before we really get something to show. Yeah. And so for, for startups, what's your advice for them? Like, you know, they have to do 20,000 things. And it kills me. Like I'm, I have my own startup. You know, some of the markets say, hey, Jason, you got to focus on marketing. Then a the salesperson, no focus on sales, no focus on this, right? And like, dude, like, everything can be no more priority, right? So how do you, what's your recommendation on that? I think one of the recommendations is focus on getting a great team. Because no matter how good you are at sales and marketing, at some point, you're just one person. And the day doesn't get any longer, the longer you're in the business. The other thing is, really try put limits on okay if i don't reach that goal by this point and the next goal by that point i'm out of here i'm not burning any more money or i'm not continuing down that path 
because that's the other thing. There's quite a number of startups where you say, okay, you really should have gone out a year ago or try to sell the let what's there in your company a year ago. And the other thing is really try to know yourself and be honest with yourself. I think one of the first startups I had was in actually was not in fintech and tech, but in renewable straws. And in the end, the guy said, no, I can't handle it. He sold his patents to one of the big companies and was like, okay, I'm out of here. And everyone was like, okay, we we got a good profit. Probably we could have gotten more if he'd been, um, if he'd driven it to an IPO, but in all likelihood, that guy wouldn't have made it till there. So we would have not gotten anything. So that kind of honesty with yourself to say, okay, it's not going anywhere. That's something which especially in the early stages, people are like looking for and trying to see in startup investors. Yeah, that's a great point. So I'm going to ask you this, like, you know, people always say, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, like, you know, don't give up, keep on going, you know, um, just don't you know, keep the faith, you know, it's going to happen for you. But like that guy decided he was time for to shut it down, right? When should a startup founder decide to shut it down? It's like, you know, like what's called a zombie startup or like when should a person like have a red flag, so to speak? I think the, biggest red flag is burnout like in any job if you realize you can't handle it if you realize you don't have any life and you realize it's not getting there that's the the bigger red flag i would say because zombie startups okay people are leaving you see that it's going to an end and if you don't see it as the entrepreneur at least your next round of investments to get money in will say okay you're a zombie startup. I looked at your books. I'm not giving you anything for a round for a series A. And that way, for these, there there isn't out. It's the problem is more the kind of the semi-successful startup who are not really growing enough to scale up, but who are too successful to fail. Yeah, basically they're like a lifestyle business. And occasionally you know, people say lifestyle business like is a bad thing, right? I mean, you can make a good living and have a nice life for a lifestyle business, but it's not the same as a VC business, of course. Yes. I mean, that can be then an exit. You say, okay, I'm giving dividends to my current investors and keep it as yeah, a lifestyle business, as a small business. And that might not be what uh, your investors will look for initially, but it's definitely better than trying to scale and then realize, boom, I was the wrong person or the wrong person at the wrong time. And this didn't scale as I wanted it because I didn't know, or because I didn't realize that the day is over at midnight. <laughs> yeah. It, it drives me crazy. Like so many people, like, I'm going to start a business because I don't want a boss. Well, now you have like so many more bosses, right? The vendors, your customers, your investors, or people like, man, I'm going to start my own company. So I don't have to work 40 hours a week. No, you, you will never work 40 hours a week again in your life. I think uh, employees and the IRS are the two biggest bosses you can always have. And yep. um, they are also the worst bosses we realize. <laughs> uh, I'm running out of money or um, yes. I'm getting issues there. So how how do you get your deal flow? Do you like, is this based on referrals or like, how's the, how do you get your deal flow? Yeah, it's normally you get a referral and then you talk to the people. You get them to show you some their pitch deck and their books and you see okay did they work a bit on the pitch deck and the book and then kind of on, on the early startup it's both the pitch deck and the book are there to see okay he thought about possibilities he thought about but it's not that okay the books look good you, you see like the numbers add up but it's more kind of the the due diligence on the founder which gets through the documents and then it's a lot of talking to them and discussing it with them. So when you do invest in someone, like how many checks did you have with that startup found? Like 10 times, 15 times? Like what's the like average number for you feel comfortable investing with someone? I think an average number would be around five, but five, okay. th there are also some which have just two touch points mm -hmm. and some which go on and on for months just because, yeah, they're, they're often then the first time founders and you're like, okay, have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? And you then see they're invested in it, both to their means financially and emotionally, but it's also then the ones who are not really at the maturity. So if someone right out of yeah. college or still in college, 
there you need okay here's a bit of more due diligence we need to do here's something you you need to look up whether that doesn't make more sense to do so then at some point it goes in more into the coaching and support membership for startups yeah and you ever invest like just by yourself or do you always invest with other people oh there thankfully they're like the smaller regulation like cf or so where you can go they're just online invest in okay which is it's kind of fun to do them in the small like thousand or two thousand dollars and mm -hmm. just see like okay. an equity like some like an equity crowdfunding campaign something like yeah that. Okay. It's, it's kind of like kickstarter just okay. for investment i think i think there's like refunder republic yeah, we fund our start okay. engine i think the two big ones yeah and that, that's kind of interesting to invest in, in technologies where you don't want to be so deep involved in i mean i'm pretty sure fintech's like your sweet spot but is there any other tech out there that excites you that you want to invest in uh b2b quantum technology that other two b2b because i'm in that space from an executive point of view so as long as i don't collide with what i'm doing in my day job i normally know what's going on there and then quantum because before being a computer science guy i started in physics and that was always more like the star trek realm which <laughs> Is a lot more techno uh, technical than what we Yeah, I don't think the average American realizes like how much tech is out there, right? I mean, it's insane. It's, I mean, I guess if you talk to, if I talk to someone who's a biologist, I wouldn't recognize what he's talking about yeah. either. Yeah, that's true. So yeah. that's, it's just that a lot of tech is either because we have it in our hands mm -hmm. as a phone, or because sci-fi likes to show, yeah, it's a warp core. <laughs> yeah, warp drive, whatever, yeah. yeah. So next, you're uh, uh, on the board of advisors for a company called, a fintech startup called Moxie. Can you talk about, uh, first, like, what, what do they do to convince you to come on the board of advisors, and what do, you, who do, what do you do for them? I think convincing them to get onto the board of advisors was, I think, that three calls, four calls with me and the team, because and in the startup world is you're normally both the board member and the and one of the investors and yeah board of advisors you normally have a, a relatively larger group who then gives advice to things and being b2b tech yeah technology scaling emerging technologies that's my focus of course but also the sales side someone who's been in sales and done sales for 10 years it's always interesting to do brainstorming with other guys who do sales. Why do you think a lot of entrepreneurs, like, I won't say they're scared of doing sales, but like, you know, like always try to put it off or like they're trying to hire someone, you know, and of course people other will say, you know, if you're, you have to do sales as a founder and you shouldn't like hire it off until you like have the first $10,000, you know, all these things you say, right. Do sales yourself. But like most people, including myself, like, man, like just don't want to pick the phone and cold call people. Right. Like what's your advice on like, overcoming that? Of course people say, just pick up the phone, but trust me, it's not that freaking easy, right? Honestly, I was so scared picking up the phone and I came over here and started doing sales. So I really put it off until our group CEO came over and like, yeah, we either need to see results or it's over. <laughs> so I think being scared of it being over helps. And the other thing is getting that one success and which is normally helpful. And my, my personal story is I got that one success in, then we scheduled the follow-up call and the first question was like, who were you again? Which was like, okay, the guy who, who I thought we had a good connection, who invited me in for an hour long meeting, doesn't remember me. So what's the likelihood of anyone who's, who's not talking at all to me, remembering me tomorrow. And yeah. I think that's the, that's the big thing. People won't remember you, even if you have success with them, unless you put them in the forefront. Mm -hmm. So anyone who says, no, we don't need your services, you're gone by five minutes later because the next fire is there. Exactly, yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the mental toughness you need to be a salesperson? It's, you need different toughs and you have different salespeople. So there's the stereotypically used car dealer, of course, who's talking to someone who can bridge the awkwardness and that takes really some skill to actually keep talking, keep someone engaged. Then of course you have the person who can shut up and ask a question, which 
that's what I find when hiring salespeople is what most people struggle with. It's once you're in the groove to keep talking, it's easy because you don't have to have the awkwardness of someone thinking and just giving them time to think. And of course, the last toughness is you just have to live with some people saying no yeah, and not taking it personally and just acknowledging, okay, they no, don't remember me. So I can really cold call them again tomorrow and they don't. That's a, that's a great tip. Like, yeah, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe like two weeks later, you know, call, call them again because I can remember you probably. Yeah, if you're really scared, uh, that's one of the mentors I had said, just call one person and I think a week later, call them again. And you'll notice he won't say, oh, wait, did you call me? They will be like, no, we don't need you. Yeah, can you talk about the points of public speaking? We're doing it here. Yeah. It's it's very similar to the sales thing. It's that scared moment of standing in front of people and assuming everyone hates you and everyone knows that you're talking bullshit. <laughs> that's... Um, I think that's the the big thing which which so many people fear so it's not the the mechanics of oh do i make a small gesture or a big one it's really the fear of having to speak the fear of rejection mm -hmm. the fear of really in our monkey stone age brains the fear of being excluded from the group because they think oh that's something we really shouldn't have been hearing from you Oh, that's so wrong when in truth if you get anyone to listen to you actively that's already a success and if people are like oh did you think of that that might be wrong most people are like okay we want to talk about it not we want to put you in and embarrass you but it's one of the things which i think comes with practice and getting over fear yeah and it's it's the same thing people jumping out of perfectly functioning <laughs> airplanes just to get that feeling of fear. Yeah, but I know yeah. most people would pick German airplane versus public speaking, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, statistics is always great that uh, more people fear public speaking than fear death. Yeah. So That's, I would yeah. assume <laughs> people will rather jump out of an airplane than stand on a stage. Yeah, we're, I mean, that's like, like I, I talk about the time, especially young people, you, you learn the skill, learn to be able to get in front of people and talk, right? Because if you do that, you can defend your position, you can convince people to do what you want them to do, right? You just have such an advantage, you get to be able to get up in front of your speak. It's both the public speaking and also the, the small speaking. So being at a cocktail party or yeah. after, work lunch, uh, after work dinner and being able to just say the three, four sentences to yeah. really get the conversation starting. Yeah, so like, I, I'm, I'm pretty decent like public speaking. I suck at small talk. Like networking, like if I meet somewhere at a networking event, Man, I, I struggle with that big time. Yeah, it's not normally everyone struggles and everyone is sitting in there and waiting for anyone in the room to start it. And that's, I think, being the first one, getting your piece out. But on the other hand, what I learned, it's not so different from public speaking. You just, if you know that there are two, three people and you can check their LinkedIn bio, mm -hmm. you know, okay, we could talk about public speaking here. Yeah. Or you can ask me, like you did about the model train or the gardening. And the same works with... Yeah, with, with all the small talk as well, as long as you know one or two people, you can get the conversation going. And as soon as there's a flow in the room, you'll have people talking to each other. It's yes. just the kind of the awkward one first minute where no one wants to do it. Yeah. And, and are you still involved with Toastmasters? Yes. Okay. I'm still. Are you like one of the officers for the chapter or something like that? Or Yeah, I have been. Um, thankfully, yeah. This, this year I'm not. So it's... It was definitely an interesting time to be it, but it's also, they have like length of term restrictions. So mm -hmm. you have to either move up or move out or take a break. And doing it during the pandemic, during it, during a time where people don't come together to do public speaking, but learn to do it on Zoom, that had its own challenges. And I don't know whether if I had done another year as officer as in especially in the higher district level where you have like multiple clubs that was a lot of work to get them to keep people engaged to pe keep people going to keep people seeing how it's relevant now that they're on zoom and not just in front of yeah on the big stages where you have the presentations 
And Toastmasters is a, just a nonprofit, right? It's a nonprofit, yeah. So what did you personally get out of being so involved with Toastmasters? I think it's the leadership opportunity and the leadership feedback was one of the big things, especially in the last two years. Because let's be honest, if you're a boss of someone, getting feedback is really hard because they're like, okay, if I give him bad feedback, he might fire me. If I give him too good feedback, he might think he, I'm just trying to get into him. And so I think in that sense, and it really helped me to understand, okay, where, where are my shortcomings in leadership, where I have to work on and what I have to do. And then, of course, before that, getting the confidence to actually stand up and not be the guy who's awake the whole night before giving a talk, which was the case in, when I had when I presented my bachelor thesis. I was like, I didn't sleep and then put concealer under the eyes to yeah. not have the big rings under there. One thing I was struggling with as well, like, you no, know, probably speaking, like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, like, getting in front of people and talking, right? Of course, I'm nervous and, uh, you know, practice. But I, I don't do good at a close. We had, a, we had a, a meeting at a company, right? And there's 10 people around the table. Each one has to say something, right? If I'm the last one, oh, my God. Like, I, that's, that, I, that, I struggle with that, right? I, I want to be the first one to talk and be over with, right? I don't want to wait to the last one in case they hear everyone talk, you know, and then all these thoughts go in my mind. I, I, I always struggle with that. I actually find it a lot easier the other way around being the last one to talk because especially in a company meeting, you can go back to what people said, mm -hmm. but that requires, of course, listening and then taking yourself a minute to, okay, it's your turn. The 30 second silence where you think about what's happening, which I find a lot easier nowadays to just give yourself the permissions to think, to formulate a thought and then engage everyone else. Yeah. Just, yeah, I think another reason I was like that, because I, I guess my thought process was there's 10 people, I talk, I'm the first one to talk, but I think everyone's finished talking, they'll forget all my mess ups, right? But from the last one talking and I mess up, everyone remember my last mess ups, you know? Because I know it's in a good, positive way to think, but. Learn to be self, <laughs> self deprecating humor is, I think, yeah. the, the biggest thing, comedy stages. Yeah. That's, um, I think one of the founders I worked with told me, yeah, I learned to, to hold team meetings by doing stand-up comedy <laughs> for like three evenings that I ran out of topics to talk about. Because if you're on stairs, if you see stand-up comedy, it's normally like, yeah, I'm making fun of myself. I'm making fun of politics. Mm -hmm. I'm making fun of something which I really shouldn't talk about. Yeah. And that kind of gets away from, from that kind of fear of saying something which is stupid. Mm -hmm. And the fact is everyone says stupid stuff all the time. So yeah, as long as you can laugh about it. And that's the thing, the only thing, as long as you laugh about it, everyone is happy that you said something and that someone said to close it out or maybe to summarize it. Yes. How, how many times have you and your family gone back to Germany? We used to do it every other year. And then COVID hit. We had the trip planned and everything booked and we're like, nope, you can't go. So we are happy to go this summer again and see how it goes with the kids speaking German in person and not over Skype. And how often have you, has your, you or your wife's family been able to come over to visit you and y'all? So my parents come pretty regularly. So that's it. The easy thing when you're retired and for Germany, you don't need a visa to come here. My wife's actually from Moldova, so her parents didn't have the chance yet to come over here. So it's us okay. visiting normally. Okay. So next, let's talk about networking. So I think a lot of people in general, startup founders, the case would be, they're like, they're like either network too much or they're, they're, they're focus on the product too much. Can you talk about the points like, you know, like having a good balance of building your, your, building your company, networking, all those kind of things? I think I haven't seen someone who's networking too much. It's either if you think people are networking too much, it's then that they're actually not networking. They're just putting themselves out and trying to get the spotlight at a networking event, which is normally the thing people seem to be very appreciative of in the first thing, but which really doesn't make you memorable because the networking events, it's, it's really an event where you want to be in and go out where everyone says, oh, we all took something out of 
versus if you sit in a presentation, you're normally going there with an agenda to, okay, I, I will learn with, about that or I skip the presentation. <laughs> so that's, I think, the too much networking is more that people don't really network. They just put themselves out and be, try to be the presenter. Otherwise, I think the thing is that networking events happens normally in the evening or late afternoon, so after four, which kind of gives you the chance to, and my schedule is it to do the really the hard creative work before breakfast and the morning, do the sales, the sports, and then afternoon for some either technical work or and then go networking in the evening. That way, it's almost like a school schedule like you have in high school and you know what's coming next. I know one thing, like a lot of people say they're networking, but every time you see them somewhere, they're talking to the same two or three people, you know, they're not meeting anyone new. Like, so I'm like, are you really networking? Or are you just like, use this as a way to hang out with your friends, right? I think I don't think a lot of people actually go to network, right? It's like when I network, my goal is to meet three new people. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't, but I always see the same people talk to the same people. I think for me, the more the point is to introduce three new people to each other. Oh, that, that's a great point. That's a great point. Because instead of meeting new people, that way you provide a direct value to Yeah, everybody. value. That's a great point. I like that. Plus, it doesn't put you on the spotlight. So if you're like me and <laughs> struggle with, yeah, picking up the phone to make a cold call, struggle with, I don't want to really do networking, then you kind of can put it in your mind that, oh, it's actually not about me. I just want to make sure these two people meet each other. Yeah, I like that a lot. What what, what network, networking events do you go to on a regular basis? Uh, I prefer like the, normally it's a kind of the cocktail party style. So four to six or six to eight. Mm. And you have like 15, 20 people in the room and try to meet them. So that's uh, the ones I prefer. Of course, the big conferences are there, but it's, I find it hard to meet just new people. So for the big conference, you really need to go with an agenda and know, okay, that's the party I want to go. It's, I need to meet that person and kind of have the, the engagement sheet in front of you. That's his picture. He likes to talk about that. He does that for work. It's kind of like your prep for this talk, yeah. probably. Yeah. To to get to really get to know that person before he goes off to have his engagement sheet ready. Yes. So what's your take on this? And you kind of already answered the question, right? I know like there's some founders out there, they're like, you know, they're like, you know, stealth mode building stuff in the, on their own, you know, no one else are building. The other people like build, it was called building a plug, right? They're, they're pitching, they're on social media, they're talking about what they're doing. Like, is, you think one, one has an advantage over another one or one has the pros and cons to each one? It really depends on where you are. So stealth mode has the advantage if you're really the very pre-revenue where you build your product or if you have a physical product, make like the prototype to get funding of. The... Once you have your prototype ready, you really need to push it out. You need to get the first customers. You need to make sure, okay, it's not just a great idea, but it's something where people want to spend money on, which it's often harder than it seems like. Because if you just do like focus groups, everyone will be like, oh yeah, that makes so much life easier. But it's not yeah, really- Of course I'll buy it for this amount of money, you know? Yeah. Oh, wait, you have a credit card swipe right there. Let me think about it and talk to my <laughs> wife about it. Or, yeah, I'll buy it, but can you add this feature and this feature and this feature? Yeah. And before you know it, your product is totally different than what you wanted to build. Yes. So you're trying to please one customer. Yeah, and uh, then you need to pitch enough and be ready to say, okay, this didn't work out. Thank you for your 10 minutes. I'm going to the next guy. So, you know, all the, all the stuff that we're the con right now, are we recession or not a recession? You know, Silicon Valley Bank failing, all the stuff going on. You know, of course you can't predict the future, but look at your crystal ball. What do you what do you see as the state of a VC or angel investing for founders in the rest of 2023? I think for angel investors, there will be still great companies at great price points out there. But as in any recession, there will be also a lot of stuff which has to be sorted out. Because people think, okay, I have this great idea. I can build a startup. I can get four or five millions in venture capital right off the bat to build my <laughs> prototype. And it's, yes, 2020, you could get that if you knew the right people. Mm -hmm. But we're, I think, more back in a normal mode where, yeah, 
if you show me you have one customer, I might invest in a seed round mm -hmm. and not if you have a great idea and want a million to build it, then it really needs to be something patentable, which you can hold in the hand, not just technology. Yeah. So I, I follow a lot of VCs on Twitter because I'm always start up and trying to build. And, and one VC put in, I can't remember his name, but he put in there, you know, hate, hate to be the bear of bad news for us, you know, entrepreneurs, but it's going to be really, really hard to you know, raise money the rest of 23. I mean, he said, like, if you have a seed round, invest, you're trying to raise a seed round, you need, need A round metrics. Do you think it's going to be that bad or this, that guy's just exaggerating? I think there's, there's a problem that in the last couple of years, people kind of confused what the rounds are for. Mm -hmm. Versus the seed round, it's really for talking to investors to making sure the team is the right team. The A round is much more focused on do the numbers add up? Does the scaling proof? Does he have a proof that he can scale the business model? And versus if I take the data sheet for, for seed round, it's there to, did the founder think about all the obvious things? And I'm less concerned of, okay, he took at 1.1, so one customer talks to 1.1 people versus one customer talks to 1.2 people, which is the series A normally looks at. And I think we get back to the point where that gets split up. So people either invest in seed rounds and do the more the person to person work versus people who invest in series A who do more the financial work and honestly invest the much higher numbers. Yes. Than so were you investing, were you in Germany or you started investing once you came to the States? Only in the States, really. Okay. Um, so can you give me, from your point of view, some pros and cons of the Seattle tech scene, Seattle investment scene, from your point of view? It's a very interesting scene in terms of that you have the combination of big tech companies, but also driven by our biggest company here, Boeing, still a lot of the kind of really old school technology, like engineering parts. So you find that very interesting combination of sales guys coming from engineering, coming from Boeing, coming from all the military stuff. Then you have the tech guys who built the product and the NISA and have that very interesting combination, which I find a lot easier to deal with than a Silicon Valley where everyone comes kind of from a tech background. Mm -hmm. well, not everyone, but a lot of people because you have some people have different ideas. And that's, I think, especially in the Seatron, very valuable that people have different ideas. And we like to talk about diversity, but it, it doesn't, diversity doesn't matter if, if you have three guys who have a different color, but they all came from Stanford, did CS at Stanford, all worked at Google and all went to the same private high school and all grew up in the same neighborhood because they all have the same kind of ideas in their head. And that's, Makes it nice for, for a metric, but it's it's in the question, is that really what we look for? Yes. So next, you also do some stuff with New Chip Accelerator. That's, that's the one out of Austin, correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, New Chip, they're almost like, aren't they like a pay for play thing where you give them an amount of money and they pretty much guarantee you'll get an investment? They have some pay for play stuff, but most of it is not. So it's, I think most of the founders are um getting in there and doing the seminars and then that gives them the investors the first right to the first pitch they have pay for play stuff both in the terms of okay here's some money and in the terms of here is some stock which honestly it's i don't know whether that's so much of a problem because they normally then give you access to almost like the MBA people who then can, okay, let's get you set up as an accountant. Let's teach you how to do the books. Let's teach you what to not sign. And I find that can be valuable for a founder, but it has to be the right founder. I would say it's probably a bad idea to go in there with, okay, I'm paying, paying a lot of money to get in front of <laughs> investors when you're mentally not ready for doing that. Yes. So there's so many accelerators, incubators out there, right? You know, of course, there's the big ones, the so Y Combinator, Techstars, the smaller ones like Generator 8, you know, there's ones like New Chip Accelerator. There's two or three in Seattle. Like, is it really worthwhile for entrepreneurs to go to accelerators? I mean, 
it has to be some kind of like obviously you get the text of the walkout. I think is a big thing, right? But we, I mean, if you go to like five incubators, what are you really doing, right? Are you just being a student all the time? Like when when is the break on that? You think? I think if you go to more than one incubator, you're doing it wrong. Wait, let me say going to more than one incubator with the same startup. Mm-hmm. Incubators are great. As I said, they put you in contact with the VCs. They put you in contact with the people who have the knowledge in the industry and really not the, not the knowledge about the technology, but the kind of the technical operations knowledge. Okay, what's up to date in HR? What can I ask in hiring? What can I? What do I have to keep in mind now with uh, new cybersecurity regulations before I do an IPO? And these kind of things. That's where I think these accelerators can help you, um, especially if you've either never done it before or if you've been out of the scene for quite a while. I would say if you go to one accelerator, finish that, go to the next one, then hopefully the accelerators will say no as well. But it's then sorry you don't have a product you have a you have too much time on your hand. Great point. So let's let's switch to cybersecurity now. So your company with now they mainly deal with cybersecurity, right? Sorry. So the company you're working with now they mainly deal with cybersecurity, right? We deal with uh, identity management, which is kind of the core. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, it, it's for you to log in and use the same username password mm-hmm. for your corporate accounts everywhere. For admins. If I say that, they're like, yeah, there's so much more behind it um, from getting the right user accounts wherever they need to, to making sure if someone retires, they get deactivated everywhere and there's not an account which uh, is there 10 years later and you wonder, why are we paying still a license for it? And why did he just download our whole database of clients? Yeah. And so I do a lot with like data security also. Data security certifications, we normally then help the clients. Okay, they put our product in and how what are the best use cases, what to keep in mind, how to extend it, how to bring in the old tech into it. So you might not be able to answer this, but what's your take on this TikTok stuff going on? Like on one hand, you'll, you people are like, you know, I don't care if <coughs> Chinese have our data. I mean, Facebook could have it too, what's going on? And then of course, I don't know if it's true or not, but then you hear people saying, well, Actually, all the TikTok US data stored in Oregon, Austin, Texas. Like, is this really a threat? What's your take on it? I think it's the unknown, which might be a threat. And the other thing is is that somehow TikTok has gone on to so many devices where it shouldn't be. I mean, if the Texas government feels the need to make a rule that you can't have TikTok on a state-issued phone, then yes, we probably should talk about the security and oversharing in general on social media. Whether to ban it, I mean, the the rules they have in place and the play they have with um, Oracle kind of protects us, but it's also goodwill between annual checkups. So if they push a new life, a new version out tomorrow or the day after the check, then and then before the next checkup, we push the fixed version out. <laughs> so Yeah, they're definitely worth it. One thing I never said is like, why you hear all the time, you know, the US government bans TikTok on, on you know, government advice. I've always been like, why is any social media on a government advice, right? Like, why is Facebook? Why, any, why, is, any, why is it only just, I get that, you're like, ban it from government advice, right? That's one thing I understand, right? It's either you're in social media and in marketing, then you should have it. But if you're, if, if, you're secu- role, if you're a security guard at some kind of nuclear plant, why the hell you got TikTok in your government phone? Yeah. Or if you're, uh, I don't know, the secret service guy walking after the president, why do you need that on the phone? Yes. That's one thing I, I didn't I don't understand, right? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Did you watch any of those congressional hearings? Sometimes when they really... Yeah, for the one TikTok, it was insane, right? Like this one senator from North Carolina asked, that, so CEO is uh, Mr. Chu has seen Mr. Chu, does TikTok access my Wi-Fi if I go on TikTok at home? You know, and of course he got blasted on social media. Like, does, if I drink water, will I still be thirsty, you know? Or if I breathe, will I live, you know? 
because some of these people don't have know the basics like yes and considering that they should have enough staff to find like exactly really relevant questions yeah like it, hey hey tony on your intern will i look stupid ask this question sir for the love of god do not ask this you know and one one lady like was calling it like, tic tac or she said uh does tic tac track my gsp like what, what the hell what's just oh gps oh uh I mean, it was insane, right? And I mean, if, if it was correct, it would be a very interesting question. But then you have someone asking the question in a way that say, uh, maybe let's move on to the next person. And then these questions get kind of railroaded over because someone who didn't know what they were talking about asked them wrongly. Yeah, of course, some people like, you know, they're going to ban TikTok. We're not, you know, we're going to lose our living or whatever. And then somebody made a good point. Of course, I've seen this on TikTok, of course. This lady say, calm down. No one's going to cancel TikTok. This is community hearing. They say, think about it. If we, if we ban TikTok in the United States, they, they might ban yeah. Apple from making the phones in China, right? And, you know, that's not, that's not going to happen, right? I don't know. I mean, we banned two away from selling that's 5G true. equipment. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, you're right. We've banned some of the networking supplies. I'm trying to remember which one from selling to U.S. government. So it's not that we haven't done it before. And likewise, in the other direction, you can't sell chip technology to China. Yeah. So on some points, it might make sense, especially if you think about networking technology mm -hmm. and backends and Honestly, how the NSA put chips into that as well. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? I mean, what the Patriot Act like pretty much got rid of privacy, in my opinion. And I could be I, probably wrong, of course, but and then you always hear these things, you know, like you know, Mark Zuckerberg's paid twenty million dollars to lobbyists, you know, get rid of TikTok, you know. So is that true or not? I, I have no idea, right? There these conspiracy therapists, conspiracy theories. Yeah. It normally people don't pay lobbyists just for one thing oh yeah that's true that's kind of we're back at sales you need to build a connection over a long time mm -hmm. and i would wager they probably have someone in there who says okay this is the disadvantage of tiktok this is why facebook is different mm -hmm. but i would doubt that they paid someone just 20 million just for getting rid of tiktok it's just the risk of uh, someone doing a drive-by on facebook mm -hmm. or instagram yeah that's true. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a complicated question uh, thing, right? You know, I know a lot of people like millions of followers, they make good money on there. There's five million businesses, but and some, I, I was watching some podcasts that had a good point. Like, or, or is it just mad because China did something better than us, right? Like, how is it that China built this great social media platform and we didn't, you know? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both that China built it and scaled it really quickly compared to the earlier social medias mm -hmm. but it's i think there's also a point in that yes it is a security threat mm -hmm. especially if if combined with oversharing and or yeah. having the device at the wrong place but whether banning it will solve it or whether then they just find creative ways to use facebook's apis yeah i mean we thought for the 2016 elections how how the campaigns could access facebook's apis yep. we don't need chinese to do spying no we don't um so if let me get your, your opinion on this. Let's suppose like TikTok does get banned in the United States. And I don't think many people know how to do this. I could be wrong. But do you think people would just like access to a different IP or, diff or use a different VPN? Like use a VPN for like Vancouver, Canada or Tokyo, Japan? Of course, I don't know how many people know how to do that, but. I would think we. Or you think they'll be able to ban doing it like that too? No, I, I think we ban it and uh, then we have Talk a week later. <laughs> different company, of course, a different CEO mm -hmm. and uh, three more layers of corporations in between the real owners. Yeah. And that way everyone can use an interface which maybe is just blue instead of black and white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From from your perspective, and of course not answering like giving a first answer or anything, but from your perspective and your experience, do you think this is really a, a national security concern? I think the combination of who owns the data, who can do the changes and who uses it, yes. Whether it's so much of concern that we need to ban the 
technology instead of banning the people who shouldn't use it from using it, okay. which admittedly should be a lot easier than banning the technology. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So next question, like I know people will say, well, Facebook does the same thing like Facebook, Twitter, all these places, they, they take our data and sell it to Chinese anyway, or sell it to Russia anyway. So what's the difference? Sure. They'll so they sell enough data as well. I think it's the difference what people put on them. As you said, it's a guy, it's a national security plant who makes like a, uh, it's, a not, it's, a, it's a nuclear power plant who makes a three minute TikTok about how his hairstyling products work. And then in the background, you have the reactor schematics. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Yeah, I think everyone can agree that that's probably pretty bad. It's, <laughs> I think that the, the the kind of the difference between Instagram and TikTok, which is I think the close competitors that Instagram, people normally think about how can I make most of the money out of it, so they wouldn't do it there because they might get fired or if no one really is interested in that background. Versus TikTok is okay. How do I get the most likes and how do I get out right now, which then gets people to do really stupid stuff. That's very true. Um... So tell us more about your company. As I said, we do identity management, username, password, or for the tech guys, how to get whatever defines the user, so name, last name, email addresses, username, and password to the different systems. So if we schedule a podcast or if you work in HR, that's the HR system has hopefully the right name in there that pushes it to us, we create like the email address, we create the username and then push that first back to the HR system so people can log in there, but also to the mail server and to CRM systems that people can either log in without a password, use single sign-on, or at least use the same password and username everywhere. And how many people work, work in the company? Around 150. 150. And are there on the Sierra area across the United States? Worldwide. Worldwide, okay. So our biggest market is still Germany. Okay, all right. And who could like a, who who would be like your perfect customer? The typical customer is someone who has like higher security requirements, so medical, government, schools, universities, so anything is more regulated. Or uh, recently, we went into the movie industry because apparently they're quite concerned about people stealing their latest movies and have some very interesting dates now in LA with special effects companies. That's interesting. Yeah, I would have not thought that they have requirements which very much mirror the Department of Defense. So this is something I know very little about, but how do you think this all this AI and chat GPT is going to affect your company? Is it going to give you better opportunities? Because that was going to be concerned about. We, we've seen hacks coming in. People either doing scam messages which automate them, which are so good that you can't really differentiate them. So we couple of I think two weeks ago and now it sounds like a long time but the thing has only been out for like what four weeks but yeah two weeks ago we had someone who got like scam messages which reference data which executive had posted on social media it used the language of the industry and then just asked okay can you please reset my password and then some other asked can you please wire me five hundred dollars for the hotel some of my credit card got magnetized and so that way we see it and then we get like, okay, how do we prevent someone from resetting the password for getting such a good email? And the other thing is with combined with the data breaches, we've seen these kind of language models are really good at finding hidden patterns in passwords. So if you not use the same password, but use like same base of a password and add something and then have use the same ending everywhere, then language models are really good at finding, okay, how how will my password look for this co company or for this service? Then if you have three, four data breaches, which we honestly have in a week probably, you can buy the password and email address and then you know, okay, what does Kevin use to shop at his favorite online store? Or consequently, what does he use for logging into his corporate email account? So data breaches, um... For data breaches, like, I, I'm sorry about this. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of data breaches out there, right? It was dangerous. 
but I think it was probably more dangerous. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong. I would have to guess there's how many companies get a data breach and they don't tell anyone, right? But like, well, I got, you know, my company had a data breach. I'm not going to tell anyone because that can make me look bad, right? And they take the risk of like, someone find out later on there's a data breach, but you know. It's very risky, both in the terms of the punishments and in terms of the the consequences you can get. And I mean, we've now seen what the SEC doing rules for public companies that they have to disclose it in like four days, I think. Mm -hmm. And if you ignore that, you can get delisted on the stock exchange, which that's pretty big. That's pretty big, but it's also our legal system of punitive damages. If you have a data breach, there's a good chance tomorrow your data will be for sale on the black market. So better disclose it and make sure people change their password. People are aware of them to get hit by additional punitive damages or pay additional money to your customers because they needed longer to react to it. And you say the black market, you're talking about like the dark web, right? Dark web, yes. Dark web. Can you talk about that real fast? Like what is a dark web? Is it really like dangerous or place you shouldn't go there? Or is like I think people have the wrong ideas that the dark web is people sitting in a dark room seeing green text go over the terminal window. It's simply websites which are on a different DNS server. So DNS is kind of like your old school phone book. You look up plumber and it tells you, okay, that's a plumber and that's the phone number. And if you change the phone book, you get it in a different city and the same as for the dark web, you change your phone book, you get different websites. And there are websites on there which are dangerous to go on. There are websites on there where you really want to make sure no one can follow you back because there are people who will follow you back just to get a kick out of it. But there's also a lot of websites in there who have people who just don't want to pay for a DNS name. So a DNS name is the thing which you enter into your browser and gets you to wherever you want to go. So it's really depends on where you want to go there. Does anyone like control the dark web or is this a bunch of people on there doing whatever they want to? No, it's in contrast to the rather structured fail safe way that's it's much more disorganized. And sometimes you even have to switch services to get to different parts of the dark web. So it's in no way re closely related to our normal internet where you know, okay, if I'm on page two of Google, I might as well not exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> exactly. So this is like a really bad example, right? So I'm guessing like if you, if you Google, I want to buy um, weapons on the regular web, you'll probably get nothing. But I'm guessing you put, I want to buy weapons on the dark web, you'll probably get stuff come up. You'll get nothing. No, okay. So think, things like that work as well as the other networking stuff by referral. Okay. So you you start off with on the points where you might be able to buy ammunition mm -hmm. and then, okay, I trust you. You can now go into the higher membership tie and okay. buy then more and then. Yeah. I was wrong. I always thought you on the dark web, you could go like, you no know, type in, you know, I want to buy drugs and stuff will come up or you want to do illegal activities. So I have that oh, totally wrong then. It's much, much more based on reputation, much more okay. on trust than okay. anything which you see in a movie where like, oh, this looks almost like other online shopping platform. I just pull my AK <laughs> into the, oh, maybe some grenades and then here's a credit card for checkout. Okay, that's that's good to know then, that's good to know. Um, so what, what's the future hold for your company? I think it will very much depends on where we go with, with technology, mm -hmm. but given that people are still very much not in love of logging into different services, I think we'll continue what we do with identity management. <coughs> and um, maybe we see, right now we see more of a chance of the cloud consolidation, which is happening right now, that people are more, more thoughtful of what they want to put on the cloud. Well, actually not what they want to put on the cloud, but how much they want to spend on the cloud. Uh -huh. And that, of course, gives new chances, but also need to make we need to make sure that 
we take the chances and we have the markets we that need our services and not go running after smoke signals. Yeah. And how, how do you find your customers? You have like a marketing plan or like refer or like word of mouth or like all of that and traditional cold calling. Okay. A lot. A lot of it, it's still, okay, you, you get the first two or three by word to mouth. And so someone finds us, someone likes it. And then you realize, okay, that's a market which might be interesting. And then we go cold calling or go to industry events. So when you cold call someone, are you calling the business owner, someone in IT, like who you cold call? Normally calling? the CTO. CTO, okay. Yeah, okay. Go, go up top down and go go more from the business side than from the technology side. Okay, and then um, I'm guessing you. I'm guessing you have like a, a a good number of competitors out on the market. They have a big one in Redmond. Redmond, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So how do you like different, differentiate yourself from these other companies? How do you make you know you could call calling where the kids be like, hey, you should come to us because you know, X Y Z. At in many cases, it's the one or two features which we realize which the early customers have in common, which then you go and okay. We made that, we saved them a bunch of money or we made sure that their compliance are now, is now a lot easier. And that normally then gives them, gives the next client the chance to think about it. Because we, everyone likes to think they're unique, but honestly, business in the same industry are very much alike. So if you have identified a need somewhere, it's normally easy to say, okay, that's what we need to go after. So how, how do you monetize? Like, it, like a company signs is like a month to month, uh, like an annual fee. How does Not, that work? Normally you? annual contracts for support. So they pay us for support and some do services, but most just the support and then kind of the assurance that there is someone to call if everything, anything goes wrong. Now, the, can they contact you like 24 seven or what's, what, how's that work? Depends on the contract. Okay. Okay. So I was the more money they paid, the more response you are. Yes. And stuff like that. Well, it's also, it really is a kind of the price question for them. Mm -hmm. And really the neat question. I mean, if you have a small business with 50 employees and everyone is home at 5 p.m., you don't want to pay us for having someone on standby at three in the morning. Yeah. On the other hand, if you run a hospital system around the clock, there's basically no way around having someone on call 24 seven. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of, kind of with everything, what you need determines what people will buy. And if you don't offer what they need, or at least have a reasonable explanation why not, they start haggling, which I will never call you at four in the morning. So why should I pay for it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, what's well, actually next? I mean, I got bring a lot. So, oh, here it was for your company. Like, I'm, I'm a big, every customer, not a good customer, right? Suppose you're like trying to get a customer. What does the customer, that customer, customer have to do where you're like, okay, this person is not the, the hassle. No matter how much money this customer pays me, it's not going to be worth it. How do you go through that process? The great thing about an open source company is not just that everyone can go into our source code, edit it, change it, but it's also that people can just download our product for free. So if we realize, okay, that guy is never going to pay us money, that guy is just trying to either push himself up for some reason or trying to get quotes for some ridiculous comparison. And you just can tell them, okay, download the product. And once you're ready to commit to services, let us know. Okay. Well, people don't know. Can you explain what open source code is? Open source simply is how the source code is delivered. So every kind of, every technology or every software product gets written somewhere and depending on how you do it, it looks more or less like the language we speak. And that again gets translated into something the computer can interpret, which is really at some point just a bunch of ones and zeros, but at the point where most software is, it's very complex, a very simple, it's a very simple language. It's like more like, and this store there. So open source just means it's a very, Initial code, which a human wrote that anyone can take, anyone can modify, anyone can publish on their own and can do whatever they want with it. So why be an open source company? What's the benefits of doing that? First of all, you tap into a huge ecosystem of 
other open source companies who want to work with you where you can make changes, where you can make modifications and really give away their code. So you don't have to develop the whole product from the base. On the other hand, it's also a trust issue <clears throat> that if we're not around, if something happens to our company, customers can simply go take the code and run it and or have someone else continue to develop it. And that makes then all the difference in them saying, okay, if a plane tomorrow crashes into Redmond, what happens to Microsoft versus our product will be like, okay, it will still be around. It might not be called Univention, but it will work the same way. How do you all like recruit and retain your developers? Like how, what's the process for that? Like, the developers like, you know, I think they're like a, like, like develops, you need them, but then like something is so hard to find a place to see how like, you know, like, you know, like place a startup founder, you want to find a developer for your startup, but then you can't afford to pay them Amazon money, of course, you know, and then some developers got a boot camp, you know, like they're not as good as they think they are. So how do you balance all that? Find the right talent for your start, for your company. For our company, I think we are slowly reaching the mid-sized business. So we have the interesting combination of paying well enough and then the open source is also a draw for developers. Mm -hmm. They want to, people who worked beforehand in open source software, worked in Linux. For them, it's often a draw to go to a company who still works there and who still has that experience. Conversely, also for college students, um, for them, it's often a draw. Okay, I work with that stuff because I'm fresh out of college and I didn't want to pay mainstream for office or because I like the idea of free software as in free beer or the freedom for both of them. And that kind of gives a draw for developers. I think for the startups I'm working with, it's a lot harder because you need to find someone who fits in your team, which is, it's easier if you have like 60 people in the room and then have smaller groups somewhere divided. Because if it doesn't fit there, you can, might be able to move someone around and not lose the investment in hiring. Versus if you're a three people team and someone doesn't fit in, you only can say, okay, I'm cutting my losses. Sorry. For the payment, um, if people are happy to work in a startup, they normally accept a lot of stocks in, in contrast to lots of cash that Amazon might offer and then hope for that big IPO, which gets them into the billionaire level. Yeah, yeah. So I know it seems like junior developers are having a really hard time finding jobs right now across the United States, right? What would be your advice to a junior developer? At, were, were they just are they out of college, coding, can we kiss me there? I mean, they have some stuff on GitHub, not much. They don't have a job yet, and they keep on getting rejected. They can't even get an interview, right? What's your advice to them? I think that two advice. First of all, publish stuff, do stuff in code don't sit there just send out five resumes a day and think okay i'm coding more when when i'm hired somewhere it's just and i unfortunately see that with myself my coding skills are getting slower and slower the less i'm doing of it and that's for everyone the same you can only learn what you practice so keep on doing projects keep on developing small things or contribute to open source software. The other thing is have a look at what ChatGPT can go and maybe a query architect, which is now the great word which is going around for junior developers is something which might in be interesting that people are looking for right now. So even in, in a place where people don't look, the right specialization can get you on. So I don't know if you're hiring developers now or not, but suppose you're hiring developers now. What would a new developer have to do to get, you know, like your attention, right? So to speak, right? We just apply online or what, what can you do? Like, you know, make yourself stand apart from other people. So for us, of course, uh, contributing to something we use, which is uh, the open source point really. But for anyone who's looking more into the wider range, look into what's currently in Vogue and try to write small programs on it and publish them. And if you look at ChatGPT's API, there isn't too much which uses it. So if you write, okay, here's my resume automation software, 
<coughs> or something like that, or here's the software which helps me send out my cover letter, which you just read. If you put that at the bottom of your email, that will certainly catch attention. And what, what tech stack do you code with? What's your coding language? Uh, Python mostly. Python, Python and Bash. And, and how long have you known that language? You've known for a while or? Since college. In college. So that's like, that's your, like your go-to? Yes, I was lucky enough to have my go-to languages in college where Python and C++. Okay. And then I went into, well, now by now it would be a project management intervention. Back then was kind of anything touching a customer except for sales. Mm -hmm. And they luckily used Python so I could sharpen that into the customer side developments. But is, yeah. Is there another code language that you want to learn or you just want to stick with Python? <sighs> I don't think I really want to learn any right now. It's more, if I see something which catches my interest, it's easy to get like the concepts over, especially mm -hmm. if it's something object oriented. And that makes it, I think, much more important that I kind of remember the concepts and every once in a while get to use them versus, oh, I need to learn Go or Rust now to be up to date. But that's also the difference someone who's, not anymore junior developer versus for a junior developer who where it might make a difference that you learn the coding language for the job you're applying to talk about this so like i, I mean i'm not a coder i'm not a developer but it seemed like you know if you're a developer whatever your language python ruby rails is always getting updated right something's changed like how do you like make sure as a developer you stay up to date on your skills because like I, I, I'm sure most companies don't like pay to do it, right? You pretty much have to do it on your own time, right? So how does that, what's your recommendation on that? I think a lot of companies actually pay you to stay up to date, to do some self-study and, and especially given, and you said you're running a business, you know how expensive it is to hire someone versus to retain them. So anyone who says, okay, we don't have a chance to develop our skills, that would be a major red flag in my opinion. The other thing is, especially for coders, hopefully companies use like code sanitizers. So if you have a big change in the language that will spit out, okay, I can't accept your request because it's not up to date or it's not using the latest, greatest features. And that way you kind of are forced to study to get away with the error. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So moving on to the next. So this, I just want to know for myself, multi-factor authorization. Does that really increase security or is this something else to do? Does that really increase security that much on multi-factor authorization? Whether it's multi-factor, it's uh, that increases security. You might be questioning it correctly because if you use something like a token or the YubiKey is a famous one, plug that into your computer, you don't really need the password to make it more secure. But from a user perspective, people have the idea that they need to enter a password for it to be secure, even if they use a token. So yes, in that sense, from a psychology perspective, you need multi-factor authentication versus just a, a token or so. Whether the whether it makes a difference and depends on what is used and what your attack profile is. So for your banking account where you might get an SMS to log in that's probably sufficient if i work in nuclear technology or if i'm developing software for the military someone really might target me specifically so in that case i can go online or i can go to best buy and buy the stuff to catch any sms going around the whole block for 19 dollars. so then it depends on what i'm using so a token is okay an SMS is probably not a good thing for any of the high-risk environments. From your point of view, what do most average Americans get wrong about data security, IT security, and all kind of stuff? Reusing passwords. Uh, what, 40% or something? So the third to 40%, depending on which study you look at, reuse their banking password for social media, reuse their work password for online shopping or social media. To be honest, I, 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 I would thought it'd be more higher than that, to be honest with you. <laughs> Maybe more don't want to admit it. Um, it's probably the, the reason is that 
that the banking password and your work password are the two passwords you think about. Mm -hmm. I would wager if I, if I'm starting asking whether they use their YouTube password for Facebook, you'll easily get into the 80% range. Yeah. But it's just my work and my money are still a bit more more valuable than anything else, including the kids' photos I'm posting on Facebook for most <laughs> people. So what is the, um, you're a treasurer for Jacobs University Bremen Foundation of America. What, what is that? It's plainly said the Alumni Association for the alumni in the US. So I went to a private university in Bremen mm -hmm. and we at some point had the luck to get an endowment here. So I'm doing the management of the endowment, the selection of the scholarship, making sure the money doesn't just disappear somewhere. <laughs> So next question, we, we've talked about mentoring earlier, but can you tell us who your mentors are, like who mentors you? Naturally, the CEO of my company, Peter Genten. Um, then uh, I'm actually a startup investor involved in a startup called Aplan Coaching and for a while I had a mentor from them. Funny enough, also called Peter. <laughs> and uh, for a long time, then of course, during Toastmasters, there's a high focus on mentoring new members to get them to actually overcome that fear of speaking. That are the three, I think, which had the biggest impact on me. Apart from the one guy, Eric, who had me kickbox in a suit one time, which uh, that's probably the most memorable thing. So I went, went to his thing and I'm like, I'm in front of a kickboxing studio. Are you sure that's where we want to meet? Like, yeah, come in. <laughs> oh, that was the guy who mentored me for sales in the very beginning when I was yeah, afraid of picking up the phone and so he had me do the kickboxing in the suit where I'm normally calling people over in. That's definitely different. And you, only, you already answered this question some before, but next part of the question is who are you mentoring? Startup mostly. So um, the two, two startups from through New Chip, which is uh, one is a fashion startup very interesting because they they somehow got categorized as tech startup and it's like no you go after people who want to invest in fashion please i don't know how they got it and the other one's a hardcore cyber security with uh, software built of materials and code signing with all these kind of things and then of course giving back at toastmasters is the other thing i'm mentoring a for one of the, my fellow Toastmasters there. And of course, at the university, I also like to go back, make sure that people learn about, okay, what's the real world and not just, <laughs> okay, this is how the classroom looks like. So what, what do you see as the future of cybersecurity? I think it will very much depend on who's fast and developing, whether it's quantum technology or blockchains, because anything we have now at blockchain and I hate that people reduce it to cryptocurrency and NFTs when there's so much more interesting uses. But both of them will are very vulnerable to quantum computing and being really able to quickly get prime numbers, just one of the or to calculate the prime numbers used in certain mathematical operations. So I think that will be one of the races we see quantum computing versus blockchains. And then of course the effect that has. Then on the other hand, what is still the problem is that cybersecurity training really is not good, I would say. It's very technical. It's very driven on shame. Oh, you clicked on a link from, from an email we sent you. Now you go to another training versus, okay, yeah, the people who did well. And I think that's also one of the reasons why cybersecurity training gets forgotten so often, why people don't remember that. You don't click on a link if someone sent you an email. It's just that the way we teach it, it's very much focused on the technology. It's not focused on the psychology behind it because it makes a huge difference if your boss sends you an email. I really urgently need my password reset. I'm in the plane and I can't get to the presentation versus the typical scam message we see. Oh, here are my five favorite spelling mistakes. Send me $100 to, and I sent you a chest of gold. 
Sure. Exactly. Um, so I know there's like all these cybersecurity startups, cybersecurity companies, you know, some big, some small. Do you think they're actually like, like how, if you have a, a business on how do you pick the right one for you, right? Like it makes any sense. Like I know there's a like, real complicated answer, question and answer. I think the, the right one very much depends on which doesn't, doesn't make it more difficult for the end user. Because anything which makes it life hard for end users is something which will be forgotten, whether it's waiting for the SMS and you're thinking, when is it coming? Maybe I should deactivate that stuff. And then natural on the other hand, also anything which makes life harder for administrators, especially in a time where everyone says we are firing people, but you still can't really get good people. Um, you really don't want to overload them with stuff which <laughs> doesn't have any use. So I think that's the two big criteria, which are both kind of user friendliness compared to, okay, the latest and greatest in technology. So what's some new tech out that excites you, whether it be blockchain or chat TTB or AI VR, what's some new, newer tech that's coming or over here that really excites you? I said quant computing is very much one of the things. Um, and then, yes, chat GTP, of course, AI is very interesting also in terms of how people use it, what the use cases will be, and what the impact will be on people, on their positions. Well, that's call center chat agents and what their business future really is there. But also in terms of how people on a psychological level react with the knowledge. Okay, I don't know whether I'm talking to a real person or whether I'm talking to an AI with a very nice voice. Yeah, I know there is some pictures in a magazine or internet, you know, like that picture, like all these famous people. And like, you could tell them, but you couldn't tell them, right? Like, if you just glanced it, like, you'll be full, right? But you like stared at, like, little, okay, that's, that's a little too good, right? I think the problem is then that a little too good is hard to define in the world where you have hundreds of Snapchat filters and marketing agencies using Photoshop. Yeah, so that's, a, that's a good point. If you look at this picture and say, that almost looks too good, is it AI or is it just someone? Yeah, I didn't think about that. Do, doing too much in the softener brush in Photoshop. Yeah. And I listened to this podcast on Twitch called uh, This Week in, in This Week Technology. I can't have gotten where you guys it. And it played a recording. Someone did an AI recording of Steve Jobs doing a speech in 2020, right? Like the annual speech, like, you know, code was hard for Apple. Like, man, this sounded just like Steve Jobs. But it was a little, just a little off, right? You, if you really, you could tell just a little bit, but you just like glance, like listen to a glance, like, yeah, Steve Jobs was still alive in 2020. Yeah, but uh, you only know that because you probably have heard a speech of Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. If you haven't heard a speech of, I don't know, Kamala Harris and suddenly have her going off in a on radio, then you might have, well, you probably have heard the name, you know, she's the vice president. Yeah. But if you don't have a voice imprint somewhere in your mind, you then might think, okay, that sounds like her. Or if you have just a very, even worse, if you have a weak voice imprint of her. And you think, okay, they really mimic the distinct speeching style well. That must be her. So from your point of view, should most average people be like excited about AI and chat GP, scared of it? What's your take on that? It is, I think, the same with lots of technology. It depends on where you are and what 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 the risk factors is and there was an interesting, I think, from French University too, where you can put in your job title and it figures out whether you're at risk from AI or at risk from robots. And robot, of course, doesn't mean 3-3PO from <laughs> Star Wars, but like that little, the more advanced version of the Roomba who goes through the office to clean instead of the cleaning lady. And I think it will very much depend on how much you still learn and how much you grow with it. I think the best 
analogy I heard say a lawyer, ChatGTP won't replace lawyers. Lawyers with ChatGTP will replace lawyers without it. Okay. Nice. Um, so what do you, how do you take care of yourself? After a long time, um, sports is one of the things. What, what kind of sports do you do? Uh, normally free weights, okay. boxing and running are the three things. Apart from sailing, but sailing is mm -hmm. like very weather dependent and not really the thing you can do every day. And the other thing is, I'm dressed up. I've started doing that, I think on a mentor's advice as well, to differentiate the guy who is raiding the fridge mm -hmm. and who's doing the food versus the guy who's in the home office and working. <laughs> so um, that, that's the other thing, really sitting, setting these little cues, uh -huh. which then trigger behaviors instead of having to think about, oh, no, I'm not going to the fridge. Mm -hmm. I'm just right now the guy who's not going to the fridge. And then yeah. once I'm the guy who's cooking, I then wear different clothes and the cooking apron then naturally open the fridge nice so what's that normal day for you like is like you wake up at four in the morning go to the gym like go to bed at 10 o'clock like what's a normal day normally it's 4 45 mm -hmm. work uh, waking up doing some stretches getting dressed then doing till around 6 30 6 45 some creative work you say you like doing creative work like yeah of course, very, like first thing in the morning yeah. and then afterwards it's normally the meetings with my colleagues in europe till 7 30. then there is a block which is blocked in every calendar from 7 30 to 9 30 which is breakfast so that's your time like time to focus on yourself and be the family. time for me to eat time to bring my kids to school that's good and then it's yeah normally then 9 30 to up 11 ish it's marketing sales so the stuff where you're in contact with people then 11 to 12 uh, i'm normally so tired from it that i do <laughs> work up, out so you've been up since four in the morning so you work out at lunchtime uh, yeah 11 to okay. 12 and then have lunch afterwards and then afterwards do either administrative work or stuff which doesn't require me to talk anymore mm -hmm. um and about how many hours of sleep you get per day so i Normally, I'm like seven hours. That's like your sweet spot is seven hours. Seven hours, 25 minutes is my sweet spot. And you said your company has people all across, all across the world, right? Yep. So how do you manage And so does the company run on Seattle time? No, it's normally each office. Sorry. Not even each office. Each person runs on their own time. Okay. We try to find like overlaps. Um, okay. Because with people across the world, like, you know, you might do it at morning, eight in the morning, but maybe like two in the morning somewhere else, right? So how do you like negotiate that kind of stuff? Yeah, not normally... It's, I think, three big. The big place for me is normally I communicate with Bremen and then sometimes with our Australian mm -hmm. guys and partners. So that normally gives two distinct meetings, okay. one in the morning, one in the afternoon if needed. And are y'all are, are a big meeting company? <sighs> we try to get rid of the big meetings, mm -hmm. more of the smaller, the one on one, so okay. the feedback meetings of three or four people. It's just you get a lot more done then yes we still have the town halls so all hands meetings but that's then set with a set agenda everyone knows what's going to be said you can get a summary afterwards and we don't have the big meetings where who wants to say something <laughs> kind of the, the meeting to have a meeting kind oh of. man in the army u.s army oh man it's so bad about the u.s army we don't mean to get ready for me get it for me it's like such a waste of time and like yeah that's one good thing i didn't like but one thing i did not like about the military like the meeting for the meeting it was horrible yeah so i i prefer the meetings where you send out the agenda send the prep points before and then discuss the prep points i think jeff bezos was also a big advocate of that versus the I'm, I'm not a fan of the brainstorming meetings where mm -hmm. let's get all in the room and think of what's a good idea yeah see i, I hated those meetings i'm an introvert right and my time I know what to say. We're like they're going like four ideas down. So like, yeah, I'm a big fan of brainstorming. Yes, it's also there are few companies who who get it right, and I admire the the Onion who have like a daily brainstorming meetings where the goal is to discard at least 400 good ideas. I'm like I could never sit in that meeting. Yeah, and it probably depends on them that you have first a good person to facilitate it, but also people who 
quickly get used to the idea of, okay, just throw it out. And then we see whether it's a good idea to discard or a good idea to follow up on. Yeah. So back to data security real fast. I just remember this. Sandra, you have to have things called GT, GDPR, something like that. GPG keys? Yeah. G, what's it? GDPR? Oh, the European Data Protection yeah. Act? Yes. Do you think something like that will come to the United States? Or are, 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 are we already pretty much doing that already? Well, we do it differently. In Europe, they do it. Okay, that's what you have to do. Otherwise, you can't sell software, can't sell product, can't make money. Here we do it. You better do it. Otherwise, my lawyer will get money out of you. Mm -hmm. Which one is better? I don't know. It depends on whether you value your data at $25 or not. <laughs> $25 and a year of credit monitoring, mm -hmm. I should say. But if we look at California as the biggest state, they already have that. And mm -hmm. that kind of drives in everyone else because there's little point in making one set of websites for California and one set of everyone who doesn't require it. On the other hand, it makes it, of course, hard for startups to then think about, oh, wait, we got our first customers in Ca California. We're actively trying to get people in the Bay Area. Now we have to take care of that. So it might be interesting to get a more national cybersecurity requirements on there. And the, almost the most funny thing about it, if you look in cybersecurity and look at the standards and recommendations the federal government publishes, they're normally ahead of everyone else and really high quality, but it's just their recommendations, their suggestions. So no one really yeah. thinks about them until they're forced to do it. Is there a state, I, I'm, I guess it's going to be California. Is there a state that has like really good cybersecurity laws that everyone has to be following? That does it better than any other state? I, I think California is the furthest ahead, and especially in terms of data privacy. Yeah, otherwise, I think the best recommendations are still then SEC requirements to for disclosure, which only hit public companies. So it's not for private companies, but at least something to you can work after. So let's just say it's it's Monday morning, you wake up and you have like a 10 things to do. What do you do to make sure you do things one and two versus going number nine and 10? Oh, the, the calendar is full Friday evening. Okay. So I'm normally- putting, So you're a big calendar guy? I'm put. I'm not a big to-do list guy. I'm like to estimate, okay, the 15 minutes blocks or five minutes blocks I have okay. and fill them up. Because otherwise there will be stuff that manages to creep up and fill up my- um, my time. I'm also someone really proponent of turning off any chat, checking emails at regular intervals, mm -hmm. not. Okay. So you're not checking your phone every five minutes. You you, you check it a certain the hour yeah. of the day. Okay. Yeah. I need to start doing that. It's otherwise there's Twitter and LinkedIn, which can yeah. really, Oh, someone else liked it. I should respond to it. And... Yeah. I mean, one time I didn't have access to all my emails one day for some reason. And those like, I got like 250 emails, but like 200 of them like this crap, right? I only had like actually 50 emails that I need to respond to. Like, like, I was like that's a good eye opener for me, right? You get so much crap from there, you know? I, I've recently read an a, a article about better out of office messages and the guy recommended, oh, if you're coming back from the vacation, just delete all the emails. If it's important, someone will resend it. Just I, I, tell them in the out of office. I saw a good one too, where um, somebody put, um, it was somebody working at Amazon. He posted something on Core or something like his out of office was like, I'm on vacation now with my wife. If one of the other 200,000 people at Amazon can answer this question, include these people here, then here's my wife's email. Contact her. If she says I can reply to you, I can reply to you. I'm like, man, that's like, that's like perfect right there. Like, like if the other 200,000 people or whatever at Amazon to include these six people on the phone can answer your question, here's my wife's email. Get permission from her, then you can contact me, right? I said, man, that, that's man, that's perfect. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm dealing with too many recruiters and too many candidates to do that. Yeah. But uh, it certainly is a good point that normally every company has someone else who can answer that. And yeah. Yes, there are some person-to-person -person communications, which you don't want to have someone take care of, but 
90% of our business email is just follow-ups and follow-throughs so that someone else can take care of. So on, on your emails, how much emails like people trying to like, sell you stuff, you know, like financial advisors, coaches, you know, like this crap, you know? I don't Like really... people that you would never buy anything from. Uh, given that I'm doing that myself, cold messaging, cold calling, I shouldn't hack on them, but I think the ones who I never look at is like six paragraphs, someone I've never heard either on LinkedIn or per email. Well, the ones I get all the time right now is like, I'll get these, like, we want to promote your podcast in Bangladesh, right? Or like, we want to increase your LinkedIn, whatever. And that I have like way more followers than them, do you know? Or, or like you said, the, I want to be a personal coach, a personal advisor. And they see this like 20 line, the single line, you know, paragraph of stuff, right? Yeah, that's, I think LinkedIn has like, if you can't say it in 300 characters, don't yeah. say it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a perfect uh, recommendation, and which admittedly if also it's, something... it's hard to do. What I think Mark Twain said, I would have sent you a shorter email, but it's too hard to do. So I sent you this long one or something like that. Yeah. Except for he probably said a letter because yeah. he didn't have yeah. emails. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you tell us like any tools you use to make your life better, whether it be for, for business or personal or any like productivity tools that you like to use? Generally, I'm a huge fan of automation, mm -hmm. whether it's Node Red for both the business reports and the home automation. So anything which doesn't have me copy data manually from mm -hmm. somewhere to someone else. Because so something people don't realize about the glamorous life of running a company is how much data there is you have to put in different reports and send to different people. And yeah, as much as that getting rid of it. Otherwise, simple calendar is always a great thing and being really up to date on using that. Yeah. I joked with someone one time that my title should be Jason Cameron, CEO slash founder slash data entry clerk. Absolutely. It's data entry or date manual data processing. And it's, it's one of the big problems that it's not, oh, here, do that. But it's like the creep. Mm -hmm. We we suddenly decide to do one report or have one more dashboard mm -hmm. or change the dashboard. And now the data needs to be entered differently. Yeah. And the data, I mean, automation is fine, but the data has to be manually entered somewhere, right? Yeah. But it's often the kind of the, the laziness of doing it of automating it, which is more the hindrance. It's, you say like, okay, it takes 30 seconds every morning to do it. Or writing automation would take an hour. So I'd rather do the 30 seconds and yeah. then be annoyed the whole day about having to copy 30 seconds of data in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that's again, I think one of the things, how much psychology is really into yeah. how we act and how we behave versus the rational being who would say, okay, it's 30 seconds. Yeah. True. Now, are you looking to hire people for your own department anytime soon? We are. Are you sales? Sales, okay. Way. So the same question, same question for development people. Like, both someone was out there that want to do sales and market. How would they catch your attention and like convince you like there was a chance? Reach out, reach out, probably for a position which is not advertised. That's a that's a great advice right there. Especially for sales people, if you just send me a CV and a uh, um, uh, cover letter which you just went through replacing the name of the company. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I might forgive that for an introvert developer. I'm not forgiving that if you're a sales guy. So let me ask you this. So I, I know, I think there's some people are like, they want the standard black and white resume, no creativity. Other people like the creative, like they like the color in the resume, like the video in the resume. What's your taking that? Or is this, are you, are you like, you know, whatever you send me that portrays you the best? So the best one is who gets the resume scanner to throw error messages, mm -hmm. especially if you're a developer, if you find a way that they don't sanitize data, so that makes it stand out. Otherwise, I think there's a mixture between it needs to be easily to process mm -hmm. for me as a person, but it also should show you. So the creativity should be in the in the text and in what you put on there versus the unicorn pink unicorn okay. the... yeah that, that's a bit much yeah like i like creativity yeah. but yeah the 
unicorns and all pink, you know, formatting. Yeah, that's too much, you know. Yeah, or if you have seven tables and the formatting aligns differently in each each section, then at some point you my brain just gets overloaded by it, and I'm like, okay, I'm just putting them aside to never be picked up again. To well, I tell myself I'm looking later at it, but there'll be then either a different resume to look at or yeah. I forget about it. Exactly. Um, so back to you and your family, y'all been this since 2013. Is Seattle like pretty much home for y'all now? Is a plan like eventually going back to move in Germany and live in Germany once they're done with everything? Or any idea yet? There's always a chance to go somewhere else, but I think home has a lot to do with the people and the roots and the community put around. So I would say it has much more to do with our neighbors and mm -hmm. their health and being in Seattle. Yeah, people don't realize that, right? Like, I live in DuPont, right? Our two neighbors, they've been with like 10 years. They're great neighbors, right? So I can't imagine moving, you know? But like, neighbors have a lot to do with it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. And we we moved from a townhouse in very much near Microsoft campus to, yeah, now outside where you actually see bears in the backyard. <laughs> and I didn't realize how much it makes a difference to actually know your neighbors to, yeah, that's a big to have them live there for years on end and not have a new one move in every other yeah. week and they don't bother you don't bother them you know they might throw a party once in a while but it's not like every day you know by exchange christmas presents yeah, yeah. Was, and if, if they throw a party you always you know if, you're invited you, yeah even if you're not invited you're you invite okay. yourself you invite yourself <laughs> yeah bring the three beers over that you'll drink and be everyone's happy that you're there Exactly. So, uh, is there anything that I haven't asked you yet you want to talk about, or anything else you want to talk about? Oh, I think you covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so, can you share us your social media so people can reach out to you? I think Kevin Dominic Carter on LinkedIn is okay. the easiest way to find me, and probably also the best best way. Uh, Carter.co is my webpage, and that has all the cryptic links to social media. Uh, do you have a so you said LinkedIn? Is that your favorite social That's media? That's my on? favorite. That's the one you're usually yeah. using on. Okay. Um, so before we get off, like, so for sales, do you have any sales platform you like to use, like like HubSpot, Close.com, or anything like that, or do you have some internal tools you use? We we're using uh, Open. Well, no, it's called Udo now. Udo, I haven't heard of them. That's Open ERP. Okay. Was uh, beforehand, so it's an open source ERP platform which we use for sales. Otherwise, uh, I'm quite recently especially with the film guys linkedin sales navigator yeah, I, i've to... used that before i don't know i like it and i don't like it, you know like like for example like you know, so for my startup we try to do hr company for now a few people so i do the building research you know small business owners for now a few people doing the numbers and like half the time it's accurate other half like you go and check it like man this company has to have 97 people or three thousand people right that to me the data's like way off it's... at least from my experience it's great in some branches. So we, we've tried to use it for medical and then cancel the subscription because it was like, no, that's like not there. But yeah, not now for the film guys. They're, they're on there. They're technology guys. They use it. So another thing I don't like about like, suppose you're, you're on LinkedIn Sales Navigator. And suppose you send like 100 messages out to someone else on LinkedIn, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, right? And then like, suppose you, you canceled it, right? And that person like replies to you like a week later, hey, Jason, I, I just saw this message. Hey, how can I help you? But you can't see who you sent it to because it's all like deleted. All the info is deleted, right? Yeah, yeah that's a... Like, and like, keep, have you, have you, you're Microsoft, right? Have you someone, keep it somewhere in the cloud so I can come back and get it back. Because people all the time like delete it, bring it back, you know? Yeah, it's, it's one of the shortcomings. You really have to think of, okay, when's our campaign over? When do we not need these messages again? And I mean, you can download them, but uh, that doesn't help you. No, it doesn't. No. Align it with whoever sent a reply three months later because they were on a three month sabbatical. Yeah. Or I mean, yeah. And, and, and how many people actually like, even know if they got a LinkedIn message, a sell and navigate a message, right? Like most people don't go on LinkedIn like other people do, you know? Yeah. it's uh, Most people don't go there daily. So you, that's the other thing. When we are back at sales, you, you can't take it personal if someone doesn't reply within a yeah. week on, yeah. on email as well. It's like people yeah. just answer them in batches sometimes. Yeah. Another criticism like on, on, a, on LinkedIn, like I know the I know for most people, the email they have on, on LinkedIn is like not accurate, right? They might have to call email, some email from three or four years ago. 
Because no one updates their LinkedIn email, right? I don't know. I I don't think that it's. I don't think we have ever used the emails from there for anything because yeah. it's in most cases the private email. Yeah. So very few people have the Their corporate email. email. And if they have the corporate email, it's then normally the assistance you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And LinkedIn, like, you know, I have a love hate relationship. Like, you know, there's I hate I love it because like stuff it does for you, but like there's nothing better out there, right? At least not that I know, right? And probably won't be for a long time. It's it's a great platform for networking for keeping, oh yeah definitely keeping follow up on connections and it's a great network for like stalking people right i'm gonna meet john brown tomorrow let me stalk him real fast you know i find facebook is still the better stalking platform especially now that they integrate instagram and everything yeah that's true so if you really want to stalk people it's i think linkedin has more curated content yeah it does yeah um so when you hire your sales people any like certain skills or like characteristics or value you look for them for covering them I think follows through follow is still the big things for any salesperson. Openness, a certain technology affinity, and understanding that at least in our space, people commit for five years, so sales cycle can easily be six months. That's I think that that's one of the big things uh, which makes it interesting to get people in who sold SAP because they realize oh how short a sales cycle is. It's bad if you get someone in who sold digital ads before and where you buy Google AdWords app optimization for a month and are out after a month. So it's more the relationship building, which we need. I mean, for if you how often should someone follow up, like four times, five times, or do they just follow up until they get a no or yes? Depends on how the introduction is and how the thing is. So. I'm sometimes also mind to say don't follow up on on long messages. Mm -hmm. So if, if you really need to send a long message with an invite, don't send a follow up because it's just either ignored or nothing. For the short message, I would say do one follow up for two weeks later, no matter whether it's email or or LinkedIn or whatever you want to, whatever you're using for the campaign, and then. At the end of the campaign, try another, do another one, which, okay, by the way, this is what we reached. This is who we got new on. That's the result. And if you want to talk, let me know. Then you don't overload it. The wor worst I think is the ones who sent like, yeah, here are 12 paragraphs to begin with. <laughs> and then next day, did you get my message? Did you understand everything I put in there? Yes. Do you understand all the acronyms and the details and all that mess? Yeah, and uh, sorry, I haven't gone further than the first paragraph before someone else sent me a 12 pi. <laughs> so that's, I think it very much depends on the, your approach and your personality. Because we have people in the team who get great results with sending just one message and never doing follow up, never doing follow ups on cold calls. I should say, if there's a follow up agreement, there's no excuse for not doing a follow up. But we also have people who do like three, four messages and or even three, four calls for the ones who don't really hate doing messages and really like calling instead before they get somewhere. Yes. Um, and, and you might not be able to answer the question, but for your company and maybe just for yourself or personally, do you think it's for salespeople to so get paid strictly commission, strictly salary, some kind of combination, like a sliding scale? What do you think the best thing for that is? I find that very hard because on the one hand, we have a very strong relationship component in there, which makes commissions a very hard thing to do because then you're six months in and before you get see your first commission paycheck. On the other hand, it's especially here in the US, the one thing which salespeople like to do because then their salary is really drawn tied to their results so in the end it needs to be a combination of both i think and it needs also to be able to account for situations where they can't uh can't do anything so if i'm selling if i have someone selling door to door and COVID restrictions kick in yeah that's tough that's tough and i think that that's in the point where i say okay you really can't do just just one or the other it needs to be a combination of those. 
All right. So I ask you one more time before we get out of here. Anything else you want to talk about? No, I think we covered everything okay. more than I expected. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, Kevin, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.